Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Las Vegas Book Festival, the virtual version for 2020. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumacher, and I am the uh, Vice President of Exhibits and Programs at the Mob Museum and the moderator for today's program. Very excited. We're going to talk about uh, one of our all, uh, everyone on this panel's late colleagues, Eugene Mooring, uh, who passed away this year. And we want to honor him by talking about his achievements as a scholar, as a teacher, and then also uh, and his influence on on us and, and other people in the community. Um, and then, you know, branch out from there into a just general, more general discussion of Las Vegas history. So um, at the, with this uh, uh, introduction, I would like to, to bring the panel forward and we will uh, kick it off. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to do is do a little round robin with the group and, and maybe starting with uh, Clay T, talk about Gene's influence on you personally, um, excuse me, uh, traffic. If you can, please go into some detail here about your you know, your relationship with Gene and 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 how he influenced you and and uh, what you think his role his importance was in the community. If you want to start, Clay T, that'd be great. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I will start by telling you that I would not be here today without Gene Mooring. Most people don't know this. But when he was chair of the history department back in the 1990s, I was going back to school to earn my master's degree in history. And he is the person who decided, we begged him a lot, several people begged a lot, that we should learn to conduct oral history. Gene didn't think it was real history at first, but he was the one who put together seminars and workshops and had people come in from Reno, from San Diego, from all over to teach us how to do oral history. So I became the director of the Oral History Research Center well after that. But without Gene, we wouldn't even know in Las Vegas how to do this magnificent way of collecting history. And it is perfect for Las Vegas because we are such a new city. So that's what Gene means to me. Very good, um, uh, Bo. I think you have a uh, you have something uh, that he was an influence on you as well. Sure, I uh, grew up in Las Vegas, and uh, my parents grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, my family goes way back in this city, and that at the time was a weird uh, characteristic. And I went to college. Back East, I ended up uh, playing ball and I had a professor that was super influential who heard when he heard the starting lineups announced at my game, heard Las Vegas, Nevada. And he came up to me after the game. He said, you're from Las Vegas. That's that's weird, right? Uh, you should write a paper in this class on Las Vegas. And I said, well, you know, I can do that off the top of my head. And he said, no, 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 you need to go digging. You need to go to the library. So I went to Widener Library. Uh, the largest undergraduate university library in the world. And I stumbled on one book on Las Vegas, and it was Resort City in the Sun Belt. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy writes about Las Vegas in a way totally different than I explain it to my friends. Uh, he does so with a, a sobriety and a brilliance and a deep, deep dedication to doing some digging. And uh, in some cases, literally, because he would study like, you know, water rights and such. Uh, but he wrote about this city in a way that was serious and that was academic. And I thought to myself, wow, this is something that I could actually study seriously is, is my hometown and the way that it's played out throughout history. And that paper led to an undergraduate honors thesis, which led to a doctoral dissertation, which led to an entire career. And I wonder uh, what might have happened if I hadn't stumbled upon that great book in a dusty old library many years ago. Bo, oh, did you uh, subsequently uh, meet uh, Gene? Did you talk to him about this? Sure, and, and as you can imagine, I mean, again, growing up in this city, uh, you know, you'd meet your sports heroes from time to time. To time. You'd, you'd run into, you know, boxers jogging in the streets uh, or a running rebel on occasion. But when I met Gene Mooring, when I first started at UNLV, it was, you know, it was like meeting one of your heroes, of course. And then, gosh, ultimately to become a colleague of his on the faculty, 
when all of it started uh, with Resort City and the Sun Belt. It was just a tremendous honor. And of course, he was such a giving, giving teacher um, that, uh, you know, it, it enabled me all these opportunities to learn from him in a more direct way through conversations. Excellent. So, Michael, I wonder if you could, um, in addition to, to answering that, the, the question uh, posed, also just give a little background on Gene. I mean, it'd be nice to, uh, for those who don't know who he was, to understand a little bit more about his background and, and uh, his role at UNLV. Well, Gene came here from New York. Uh, he had gotten his degrees in the City University of New York system, and he was an urban historian, a historian of cities. And he once told me that what you did in that line of work, ideally, you went to a city, you did its history, then you went to the next city. Thankfully for us, he stayed here. He studied with one of the founding fathers of his field, a guy named Richard Wade, who wrote, a, among his books, a study of how cities were crucial to frontier settlement. We think of the frontier as the Wild West. And Richard Wade said, no, uh, we we're talking about communities. Gene's second reader, as we call him on the dissertation, was Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And Gene even got to edit some books with Schlesinger. And from Schlesinger, uh, I think he picked up this belief that history needs to be written clearly. So uh, Clay T will vouch for this. Uh, I have term papers with a bunch of address labels on them with red ink, where Gene would write in over what you'd written to say, no, 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 no passive voice or anything like that. He came to UNLV in 1976, and he was always very proud that he succeeded John Wright, for whom the history building is named. And Gene taught at UNLV for 40 years. Soon after coming here, he figured, I'm going to do the history of the cities, I'm going to do the history of Las Vegas, and began his research, which culminated in the book that so influenced Bo and has influenced me and everyone else on this panel. And uh, Gene ended up retiring after 40 years, and uh, sadly, uh, his life ended too soon uh, for him really to enjoy his retirement. Uh, but he left quite a legacy for us, and it includes the fact that we have a PhD program in the history department. He was instrumental to getting that started, in addition to getting the department into oral history, as Clay T. discussed. And Mike, in terms of your relationship with him, what... Um uh, you know, you were you were a young budding historian, and, and Gene was a little bit more of a veteran. What? Uh, how did that work out? This is tough for me to talk about. Uh, I had my first class from Gene when I was an undergraduate. I had him as a grad when I was a graduate student, and he went from being professor and mentor to friend, colleague, uh, co-author, and co-conspirator. And uh, I have to say that uh, that is not something that every student gets to have with a professor, and I'm grateful that I had that opportunity. But Gene was the student's advocate. I mean, he was eternally pro-student. And the other thing that was fun about Gene, to convey something that's more personal, Gene, for years, the joke was that he would dissolve if he was out during the daytime. Uh, Gene was an absolute night owl, and we figured out that he and I could get together for a meal, his lunch and my dinner. And every time uh, he was going to lunch, it was four o'clock at a restaurant across the street, which was then JoJo's. And so I would join him, being a single young guy with nowhere else to go, and uh, we would eat there together and talk about everything from history to departmental stuff to everything else. So it was a closer relationship, I think, than a lot of students get to have. And it has meant a lot to me over the years. Excellent. Um, Larry, uh, now we should let people know that you're, you are a Las Vegas historian of a little different sort because you live in Missouri. And mm -hmm. you, you have studied many things, uh, not about Las Vegas, but you discovered Las Vegas somewhat later in your career. Can you talk about that and then also how Gene fits into that? Absolutely. I, I really was intrigued by Bo's story because we have a similar introduction to Gene Mooring. I was a historian of uh, English settlement in the colonies, and I was doing research on the island of Barbados in the early 2000s. 
and I'd been coming to Las Vegas as a tourist since 1992, and I began in the late 90s to try and find out a little bit about Las Vegas history, because I knew very little. And I read bits and pieces, and I finally decided I need to read a scholarly work. And the one I, I bought was uh, the same one that Bo did, and I brought it with me today, because this is the book I took with me to Barbados in 2002, as I was finishing my research for a book that it came out in 2003. And each night, after I'd done my research and had a nice meal and walked along the beach, I went to my room and I opened up this book and I became so enlightened about Las Vegas history. And anyone who knows anything about what I've published in articles and books knows I'm intimately interested in how did the city promote itself from 1905 to the present. And I remember that I had jotted down some notes in reading this on the island of Barbados, and the reason I brought this with me is that the first note I have after reading this book in my hotel room in Barbados was, following his lead on page 67, how over time has Las Vegas sold itself? So the, the seed for my interest in, in Las Vegas history began by reading Resort City and the Sun Belt. Now, I never got to know Gene very well personally. We had uh, one phone call, I had three conversations with him in person, and then we exchanged several emails. So I, I knew him really just professionally and not personally. So I have to rely upon my co panelists on the personal side of, of Gene Mori. Thank you, Larry. Um, I want to um, talk about the book a little more, um, even though we've touched on it a few times. Maybe. Maybe start with Mike on this one, and, and we can go around the group. But but so, what are the attributes of Resort City in the Sun Belt, um, and and how does it fit into the the sort of body of works about Las Vegas history? Well, I think it's the beginning of the body, if you will, on a scholarly level. It's the first full scholarly history that we have. We had some fine histories before that. Gene brought in the footnoting. Uh, he brought in the depth of research that earlier works had not achieved. And so I think what Bo and Larry say is very appropriate, that what you find is the a lot of the work on Las Vegas growing out of Resort City and the Sun Belt. Uh, there are books that are sort of pioneers on the trail where uh, scholars, whether they're in history or sociology, uh, are always responding to them. And Jeans is the example for Las Vegas, I think. So I'd like to add to that. So yeah. Resort City in the Sun Belt has a chapter, chapter six, that starts to talk about the black community in Las Vegas. And that is my area of research. So that is the fir very first thing I read in order to capture oral histories throughout the African-American community. It was concise. It was in great uh, detail in a way. It was very well documented. So I had all kinds of sources that I could now go to to actually dig deeper into the research. So Jean's book did all of that for me. And it talked about places and people that I would have never gotten to know. Could I jump in, Jeff? Yes, please. What I, what I think of when I, every time I see this book on my shelf, I think of two words, federal trigger. It's, it's chapter one, and it, it really is something I've depended upon in almost all of my articles and books, and it's that that remarkable coming together of all this federal subsidy of Las Vegas' development from Boulder Dam to the New Deal programs, through the gunnery school, which becomes Nellis Air Force Base, to basic magnesium, to the atomic test site. And, when, and the great irony, which he points out, this occurred in a, in a true libertarian state, a true libertarian state and, and Clark County and Las Vegas dependent upon so much federal subsidy. So that's, that's always my, my, my default thought about this book and it really has had an impact on what I've written. You know, Larry, that was, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, from, and I have a experience much like yours, Larry, and, and that 
you know, reading Resort City in the Sun Belt was sort of the the uh, impetus for me to write about Las Vegas uh, you know, as well, sort of picking up where he left off in 1970 with a little bit more of the modern era. Um, but it's that federal role that I, I feel like it's, it probably is not revolutionary. I mean, it, it happened in Phoenix and Tucson and Los Angeles and, and other Western cities. But the fact that Gene picked up on that uh, seems to me to be a significant uh, a historical trend that, that he identified and that was so true for Las Vegas. Do you think that's true, Mike? I think it is. And, you know, there have been histories of other cities in the West. And one of the things that Gene conveys in Resort City in the Sun Belt, I think, is that Las Vegas is like everywhere else and nowhere else. Uh, we are, after all, a Sun Belt city a southwestern city, and there are aspects to that story that are true everywhere else in the southwest. But Las Vegas being a tourism city and a casino-oriented city, that makes things different. So he brought in those comparisons, but when you look at these cities, I remember at one point he and I were working on a an edited volume we were contributing to, and I was doing the Jewish community, and I was looking at the work on the Jewish community in Tucson, and it was essentially everything that happened here happened 40 years earlier in Tucson. Uh, we were a younger city, and at the same time, Gene could look at those areas and those works, and it helped inform what he was doing here. Yeah. And I think too, Jeff, if I can jump in here, I think, of course, you know, the, the story has been written about Phoenix. It has been written about Tucson. It has been written about other Sunbelt cities. It was just that it was so un unexpected for it to be true of Las Vegas, where the public had this very specific narrative that had nothing to do with the sorts of things that Gene brought to light. Uh, and I can speak about how that affected me personally, because I remember reading Resort City in the Sun Belt for the first time, again, as an undergraduate many years ago, and thinking, this is what I've been trying to explain to people as somebody who lived in Las Vegas, grew up in Las Vegas. So many of us have had the experience where we try to explain to people that there's more to this place than the Strip or Fremont Street. Many, many, many books have been written on the Strip and Fremont Street. And as a result, the public imagination was that this was a city of a street or two. But Gene told the story of a community well beyond that. My grandfather, my father's father, was a military veteran who came out here after World War II because he had an arthritic knee and the dry climate was better for it. And then he got a great job out at the nuclear test site that he took the bus out to every day. Gene wrote about each of those aspects, right? From like, you know, the dry climate to, again, the federal trigger to the transportation system to the relationship with, uh, you know, the military. All of those things were, were everyday things that my grandfather embodied, but that nobody was writing about. So once more, I think what he did once more was he, he brought a level of sobriety to a city uh, about which few are sober. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I'll throw in in that regard that there are other works Gene did that contributed to that. Uh, the university asked him to do uh, its 50th anniversary history. And Gene's joke about that was that what he didn't put in would have made quite a book, uh, since we all had to live on campus after that book came out, and a few things he could have gotten into and didn't. And he did a history that compared Reno and Southern Nevada, and he called it a tale of three cities, because he was arguing that the city of Las Vegas and the Strip are different, and we need to grasp those differences. So. Resort City in the Sun Belt is the true pioneer on the trail. Uh, at the same time, he added to it later. And I think um, something that you know, Bo is sort of alluding to that I, I deal with quite often in my work at the Mob Museum is the, this lens that people at the museum see Las Vegas through, right? They see Las Vegas as having been built by the mob and, uh, and that the mob controlled everything and that, uh, that, you know, we, we want the mob back because it was always better when the mob was here, that kind of stuff. And, and I'm constantly you know, battling that, you know, sort of balancing that with, with Gene's, Gene's perspective, which is, you know, the mob could not have built the water system that came, that, that created Las Vegas. They could not have built the highway to Los Angeles 
you know, it could not have built Hoover Dam, uh, and all of these things that that really have nothing to do with the mob, and and uh, so uh, that's why it's important. That's one reason it's important, I think. Um, Gene, you know, we've talked about Gene the scholar, Gene the author. Uh, Gene was also a teacher, and uh, forty years, and. Um, uh, I wonder what he was like as a teacher. He won several awards uh, for being a teacher, and uh, he must have been pretty good at it. He was fabulous. But he was also, uh, he spoke rapidly. So it meant that you had to take notes. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't even smile at your, the person sitting next to, let alone have a side conversation, none of that. You had to write every second you were writing because he expected you to take those facts he was giving you and when, when he gave you an exam then you could do an analysis of that and could answer his questions but you had to be in class so you had to use the books you had to use those lecture notes and then you had to think you had to be a critical thinker in order to pass the exams so you had to do it all Gene expected it, and he, he didn't repeat himself a whole lot, and, and we didn't have any recorders, so we just had to do it. Well, and I'll throw in that uh, Gene, in his upper division courses, like the history of cities in the U.S., mm -hmm. he wasn't big on textbooks. He wanted you to read studies of the field, yeah. so he served as the textbook. And I always thought it was interesting that as outgoing and easygoing in some ways, as Gene was, he didn't want to talk to you for about 30 minutes before class because he would sit there and go through his notes and sort of psych himself up to go in there. And then when he went in there, you got a lot of information, you got the analysis. He was also the opposite of a word that rhymes with mooring. He was not boring. He was also a great storyteller. And I confess there's plenty of stuff I'm still using uh, that I got in his classes. And he would tell about things that happened to him as a Las Vegan uh, that helped in some ways explain the city. And uh, I'll use one. Gene lived behind Sunrise Hospital at one time in a townhome. And he told the story that one day he's outside washing his car and the guy from the next condo is also washing his car. And he was a casino dealer somewhere. And I'm sort of prick up a little because my father was a long time casino dealer. It wasn't him. And Gene said, and he had the radio on, on top of his car and it's playing music and all of a sudden it stops and you hear this is a CBS News special report. Emperor Hirohito has died. He will lie in state at the Imperial Palace. Gene said the guy turned and looked at him and said, these hotels will do anything to attract Japanese tourists. <laughs> now, what that gets to is something Bo talks about growing up here and dealing with, and I dealt with growing up here, which is we're like everywhere else, and we're also like nowhere else. Only in Las Vegas would you hear a line like that. But that's the kind... And, these things, mind you, could happen to Gene. Gene sometimes managed to attract strange things happening to him. But I'll say another thing about Gene as a teacher that I think is important. He believed in stretching himself. He came here to teach the history of cities and the history of science. And his dissertation was on 19th century public works in New York City. He ended up teaching courses on America since World War I. He ended up teaching a course on families and their histories, business history. Uh, he believed we owed it to our students to be as diverse in our approach to history as possible. And that's an important thing about him, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I want to uh, transition just a little bit. You know, Gene will play into everything we're talking about. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting that Las Vegas is – has become just the city, you know, this this community is a significant area of study, whether you're looking at it from a historical standpoint or political, sociological, probably psychological. Um, 
there's only a handful of American cities that you can say that about. I imagine that there are, you know, a half a dozen or more historians who spend the bulk of their time talking about Las Vegas or talking about a city. Um, what is it about Las Vegas history that draws so much interest, do you think? Maybe it, maybe it start a little bit uh, strangely. I'll start with Bo, because even though you're not a historian per se, you, you talk to a lot of people, you meet a lot of people. What is it about Las Vegas that history that, that draws yeah. people? So I, I'm a sociologist, and so I view things through sociological lenses by training. And I think part of it is that Las Vegas reveals so much about us sociologically as a society. As a so, for example, um, when it comes to race relations or gender in society um, or the shifting dynamics of America with immigration, Las Vegas often reveals who we are before the rest of the world starts to think about it. So whether it is the Mississippi of the West deserved reputation that we have and that Clay T and, and uh, Michael Green have written about so extensively, yeah. Gene wrote about that. And it really revealed once more the ways in which, as Michael keeps putting it, Las Vegas was just like the rest of the country, albeit in a way that was incredibly illustrative and I think poignant to people. Um, the stories of Sammy Davis Jr. performing to sold out crowds and then, he, then having to leave because he couldn't stay at the actual hotel at which he was performing, that had a way of illuminating, uh, which is ironic because Las Vegas is a city of lights, right? Sociological issues for people in a way that people like Gene Mooring could really tell well. And so once more, I think it's because it's such a, a fascinating human study, human laboratory. It, it, you know, Las Vegas is a place where you love to sit on a park bench and watch the humanity roll by, right? It kind of it brings out the sociologist in all of us. What was unique about Gene was that once more, he refused to get caught up in sort of uh, the Hollywood version, but instead real his scholarship was so rigorous, was so, so in-depth, and he gave us a methodology, really, um, that hopefully lives on long uh, past his passing. Larry, what do you think? What's uh, why? Yeah, that, that's so fast then this was something that I was very interested in when I was working on a book that I called Bright Light City, and I wanted to get a sense of how have people viewed Las Vegas over time, whether it be historians or journalists or just tourists. And what I discovered very quickly is that most people have a very superior attitude towards Las Vegas. They're, they're either dismissive of Las Vegas, it's not Chicago, it's not New York, it's not Cleveland, it's not a real city, or they have this um, caricature of Las Vegas. Las Vegas is uh, a den of iniquity. Uh, people only go there so they can sin like they would not sin at home. You don't go to Las Vegas to see uh, great art. You don't go to Las Vegas to hear a great symphony. You go to Las Vegas for vice. And I found that was ubiquitous, whether it's the 1920s or the 1950s or the 1980s. And it, it's this uh, sense of Las Vegas from whether you're a Midwesterner or someone from the East Coast, that it's somehow a, a renegade city. And I was intrigued by that, and I, I, I wanted to understand it as, as best I could, so I've had to go to Las, Las Vegas 64 times to do research, to try and understand all that. But well, I think what attracts people the most to Las Vegas is that they want to understand how it is different than any other American city. And we have those people coming. I work in an area in the library here at UNLV called Special Collections and Archives. We have people coming from all over the world who want to write about Las Vegas. And they just, they, they want to write about it, but they also want to, to film it. They want to do documentaries and movies. They want to show this thing to the world that they found. So not everybody succeeds, of course, but people come here and they do all kinds of research. They, they love the city and they hate the city sometimes, but they are fascinated by it, no matter who they are or what topic they wanna research. 
So they come here and they ask us all kinds of questions and they're just, they're just intrigued by this city. And of course we adore it. So we just love talking about it. I have to give you a chance, Mike, to, to chime in on this and I'll, I'll wrap up on this topic. <laughs> Well, I, I'm also reminded of a story I heard in graduate school after getting my MA at UNLV, and Gene loved the story. And it was a professor who'd written his dissertation on Alabama in the Civil War and Reconstruction. And he visited our class and we said, well, do you have any advice? He said, yes, don't write a dissertation on Alabama. He told about another historian who was doing a dissertation on Georgia, where he was evaluating these two counties to compare them. And he chose two counties within an hour of Atlanta so he could stay in the city at night. And that was essentially Gene. Gene wanted nothing to do with a small town. But part of the attraction is that Las Vegas is itself an attraction. And then you have the people who either want to look at it just as an attraction or want to try to figure out what's behind the attraction. And that combination brings us, I think, a lot of interest that we might not otherwise uh, have or get. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I would, I would add one thing, which is, you know, over the years I've observed, and as we all have on this panel, you know, what I call parachute journalists who come in for a couple of days and they, they walk away. I don't care how, how reputable their newspaper or magazine is, after two days, they understand the city perfectly, and they're going to tell you all about it in yeah. 3,000 words of uh, creative fiction. And um, and, and th that's where, you know, some the books like Resort City and the Sun Belt come in, because I, there needs to be a corrective, you know, for that kind of work. But I also, uh, I think there's, uh, there's in terms, not so much with the journalists, but other people in general, they, there's a feeling that there's an underworld. There's a there's something below the surface of Las Vegas that they want to get at, and it 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 is there actually, as it is in many cities, of course. Um, and, and digging under there uh, is a task that uh, is is fascinating for me. But uh, I will uh, a lot of times what's underneath there is you know the same things you see in other cities, right? Political corruption and you know uh, some kind some forms of organized crime, things like that. But but um, you have to understand the whole picture, and I think that's where that that's where a lot of these folks fall down. Um, so I want to ask about um, which areas of Las Vegas history have been well covered by historians. We've talked about Gene's book, of course, Michael's work, etc., Larry's books, um, and and which areas still need to be studied in greater depth. So, you know, what what have we done well? What do we still need to do? So I haven't written my book. That's right. There's one. There's one. So and and that book should be written. There there are things that there are events, celebrations, um, riots, revolutions that have gone on in the black community here over time, and we have not written about that in the way that we should have. I should say I have not written about it in the way that I should have. Uh, I do lots of presentations for all kinds of groups throughout the city. The last presentation I gave was online the other day to Microsoft in Reno. Uh, people at Microsoft in Reno came there from Northern California. They don't know anything about Blacks in Las Vegas. So their, uh, their equity committee wanted to talk about racism and race in Nevada. And so there's just so much to be written that we still need to do. And so I'm going to have to retire and do that. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? Well, first, I don't think Clay T can retire, but her book will be the book. Uh, years ago, somebody asked me about doing a history of Henderson. And I said, the rule in the history of Nevada uh, traditionally has been either it hasn't been done or it's probably time that we redo it. And I think there's a lot of that with Las Vegas. Uh, Jean sat out a lot and we've done a lot, for example, on the history of women, but have we had a real history of the woman's experience in Southern Nevada, if such a thing is really possible? 
uh, the black experience, as Clay T. discusses. Uh, Tony Miranda in anthropology did a book on Hispanics in Southern Nevada. It was over 20 years ago. A lot has changed. A lot needs to be done. So there's been work on ethnic groups, including two volumes of essays on various ethnic groups here. But we do need more of a sense of the urban geography and ethnicity and urban environment. Uh, it's, it's funny that Gene wrote very seriously about Las Vegas, as he should have, and he took it seriously. There's an area that people don't really take that seriously, and Larry has done some great work related to it in particular, but the history of entertainment here, uh, that in itself is a history, not just, oh, Frank sang this here, but the workers. Uh, we've had great work on showgirls, for example. What was it like to be an employee in the casino and in the back of the house? We know a lot less. So there's still a lot of terra incognita out there. So and so and so Jean helped to start oral history here. And we've done oral history projects on the Asian community. We're starting that one right now. We've done the Latinx community of the Jewish community. So when people now come here to write about all of those communities well, we may not have books on, but we have oral history. So you can go to those histories and then be, you can go to the person who even talk more about the history of all of those enclaves that you might not even think about when you're talking about writing a book. And we should add that uh, Clay T and the gang at Special Collections have done great digital history projects on these subjects. It's not just the oral histories. You can go online and find the oral histories and photos and all kinds of other sources uh, for doing that research. I think we can all agree there's, there's so much that needs to be written, but it needs to be written using Gene's methodology. That's what he really leaves us with, is a legacy of a methodology that had not been deployed prior to him uh, with Las Vegas, certainly. Uh, I remember, again, when I first came across Gene's work, I went to my professor who said, you should write the paper on Las Vegas. And I said, yeah, let me tell you about this spectacular volcano that exposed every half hour and half an hour. And there's going to be a new pirate battle down the road. And he said, look, I don't want to hear that version. I want you to really go digging and really unturn stones in a way that reveals a Las Vegas that is that is deep down. I want you to get dirt under your fingernails, I remember him saying to me. And so I went to the library and I found Gene's book and I found a methodology. I found a voice. I found an approach to looking at things uh, that were in the public eye, very spectacular in nature, but finding very unspectacular, albeit super interesting foundations for those spectacular things. And that is something that's influenced me throughout my career. I, I wrote a report that ultimately went to the National Football League on the degree to which Las Vegas could be trusted to have uh, the Oakland Raiders become the Las Vegas Raiders. And in doing so, there were many questions that the NFL had that um, you know, were similar to some of the questions we've been discussing. The fears that they had, this is not a city, there's a lot of trouble to be had, there's all of the gambling on the strip and the shiny stuff. And I started to do some digging and found that, for example, one of the metrics that uh, people use when they're looking at whether a city is a connected community or not is the number of, uh, of guard-gated communities or gated communities overall. And Gene had done that. He had gone to measure uh, the number of gated communities in Southern Nevada. And we found that Southern Nevada had the same number of gated communities as Denver, as Phoenix, as San Diego, as Seattle, all of which, of course, already had NFL teams. So if the NFL was really worried about Las Vegas not being a real city, they should have been worried about these other members that already were members of the NFL family. Larry, I'll let you wrap on this. Yeah, my, an my answer to that is uh, I'll take Gene's work as, as a point of departure. One of the last things he did was a, a really fine article on Mayor C.D. Baker. Uh, mayor in the 1950s. When I read that, I initially read it and I thought, well, why should we spend so much time on a one, two-term mayor? But then it struck me that one of the areas we haven't done very well is who are the community builders of Las Vegas? Who are the political leaders over time? Who are the educators? Who are the lawyers? Who are the physicians? 
who are the architects, who are the uh, nurses, who are the journalists, who are the city club leaders who built Las Vegas. Uh, so we've done a lot on the hotel developers and, and the particularly the resort hotel developers and, and the casinos. But that, that's an area that <clears throat> I think needs to be pursued. So my last two uh, lengthy trips to special collections uh, has been to try and, and discover who all those people are and, and why did they take leadership roles in, in building Las Vegas between 1905 and, and 1955. And again, my point of departure was one of Gene's works. All right. Um, you know, one of the things that crosses my mind uh, with, uh, with Gene's passing is that, you know, um, is there a next generation of, of you know, young historians who are going to take our place? In other words, is the interest in Las Vegas history uh, uh, passing, passing down in the, through the generations? And probably Michael and Bo would have the, well, maybe uh, wouldn't have the, and Clay T would have a good answer on this for sure about, like, are, are you seeing an interest in Las Vegas history and in terms of people uh, uh, writing about it, thinking about it, researching it? I think we'll be fine. I, I just, I, you know, I, as somebody who gets the privilege of, uh, you know, standing up in front of a group of young students every semester at UNLV, uh, I can tell you they're they're fascinated by Gene's work because we continually reintroduce it, and that's the beautiful legacy of an educator researcher like Gene is that you never really die because. You're read by people who then think differently, who then teach other people, who teach other people and so forth. So I really, I see great work and it's not always in books um, nowadays, sometimes it's on blogs, but I think the spirit is very much there and I, I see it as, as just this beautiful legacy of a brilliant educator. What do you think, Mike? What do you see? I see it in the students who come into special collections. We have students who come into special collections to do all kinds of research. And of course, Jean's books are always used by them, but these students are expanding that. They're looking at manuscript collections that we have here in special collections and archives. So they have new sources as we collect additional sources. So they have things that we didn't even have 15, 20 years ago. And they now have all of that at their fingertips and they're using it. So I don't think we have to worry about the future. I think, it, I think they have it covered. I'll second and third the motions. And I'll say that uh, this semester I'm teaching my first graduate seminar. I have one student who in fact worked on the Latinx digital history project. She is doing a study of the Latina culinary workers in the frontier hotel strike of the 90s. And these are the kinds of subjects we need studied. Another student is doing her paper uh, related to tourism in rural towns in Nevada. And she's mostly looking at rural communities. And with all of that, I said to her, have you ever read Urbanism and Empire in the Far West? And she said, no. That's one of Gene's books. And it's on how there were urban networks formed throughout the Western states and territories in the 19th century. Not necessarily Las Vegas, although he ties Las Vegas in with that. But uh, the students are out there. Uh, there are other faculty who, who will do kind of what Gene did, what all of us on this panel have done. We end up in a particular place and start digging into it. In Larry's case, we say, all right, let's go to that place mm -hmm. and dig into it. Uh, Bo and I are unusual in our profession. We've gotten to be at the university in the town we grew up in. Unless you're in say New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles or a similar much larger city, that often doesn't happen. So we also encounter students who as they come here or faculty as they come here, who suddenly say, oh, hmm, you mean nobody's looked into this? That's right up my alley. And then they will go to Gene's books and uh, start there. And I just throw in, if you think about it, uh, people we have also lost 
who write or wrote the history of this area. Hal Rothman, Frank Wright, Ralph Roski. They all came here from elsewhere and they all developed an interest uh, for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're glad they all did. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, in our final moment here, um, I wonder if the, Mike, you might have another uh, uh, funny or different story to share about Gene. Uh, and if anyone else has a, a story, I think this would be the right time to, to tell it. Uh, before we were doing this, uh, my wife and I were going down our list of Gene stories and decided for uh, an audience of uh, varied people, we might not tell a couple. But I'll, I'll tell you a personal favorite of mine, which is, and Bo, uh, I've got to rely on you too. Uh, you may remember there was a place called the New York Deli around oh. Eastern and Flamingo. And I'll never forget this. Gene and I went there once or twice. And Gene told the story. He said, I was there one night and the, uh, the owner said, my bagel guy died. What? My bagel guy died. And Gene said, he put his knife and fork down. Look at the guy said, go to Brooklyn, get a red eye tonight, get back there, get a bagel guy. You can't survive without a bagel guy. The guy said, I got one of the only delis in town. I'm not worried. They were out of business within three months. And so Gene would tell you Las Vegas was mostly civilized except for the bagels <laughs> and maybe a couple of other things. Well, uh, but at any rate, that, that's what you get uh, going with Gene to eat. Uh, the other thing I'll throw in is that uh, when I would eat with Gene across the street, uh, Gene had a fairly regimented lifestyle. And uh, I think uh, his wife, Christine, uh, both fixed it a little and adapted to it. But uh, we would go across the street to, to eat, and the waitress would come over and uh, greet us and then look at me and say, what will you have? And I'd say, uh, oh, I'll have a burger and fries. She said, okay, walk away. Ten minutes later, she'd come back with both orders. And one time we were there, and Jean said, uh, I don't know what to eat. And she said, it's Thursday, Jean. You have spaghetti and meatballs. Jean said, how could I forget? So um, I don't know if there's a lesson in that for us scholarly types or not. But Jean was also a person who enjoyed fine dining. Indeed. When we uh, we found ourselves with him once in Reno, and he took us, some of his students to a steakhouse in Harris, and it was one of his favorite places. So he had these favorite places in cities that he would go throughout the state, and he knew which steakhouses would have the best steaks, which one was more like New York. So he introduced us to places. If you would catch him in a, in a city, he could introduce you to a fine dining restaurant. So yeah. those are the things that I remember about him as well. You know, Clay T, when he and I were in Reno, he took me for hot dogs. So I'm gonna oh. rethink my relationship with him. <laughs> Too bad, Mike. <laughs> they were good hot dogs though. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think we've uh, we've come around to the end of our uh, tribute. I think we've done a, a, a great job. Thank you all very much for uh, your your comments and your stories and your ideas. Um, I encourage the people who are watching this or who have watched this to go out and find Resort City in the Sun Belt if you haven't, uh, don't already have it. Um, it'll help you to understand Las Vegas. It'll help you to understand the American West. Um, and it'll help you to, you know, if you live in Las Vegas, you'll have a much greater understanding of the city as you drive around, as you walk around. You'll be able to tell stories to your friends about the past, and that's always helpful. Um, so thank you all very much, and um, I look forward to, uh, to further discussions about Las Vegas history uh, down the road. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.